In this mini tutorial, I'm going to introduce some essential concepts which I hope will help you to develop a richer appreciation of the cranial nerves. And we're going to do this by drawing a comparison between cranial nerves and spinal nerves. So the first thing that we need to do um, is to remind you about spinal nerves. Now, as you are aware, the spinal nerves are those nerves which emerge from the spinal cord and which contain both sensory and motor, as well as sometimes autonomic components. So here's an overview of the entire central nervous system and we can show here the spinal nerves emerging in pairs as red lines here. Now if we take a cross section through the spinal cord, say at around about this level here, we see something a bit like this. So here is our section through the spinal cord, a, a transverse section. Okay, and let's say for the sake of argument that this is at the thoracic level. So this is at the thoracic level. Here is the central canal of the spinal cord and I'm drawing in the grey matter. So that's the dorsal horn, the lateral horn, the ventral horn the ventral horn, the lateral horn, and the dorsal horn. So that's the grey matter which I've just drawn in that butterfly shape. And as you'll recall, outside of the grey matter is the white matter. Grey matter is composed of cell bodies with synapses. White matter is composed of axons. Now, if we're going to show how the spinal nerves are made, we need to add an additional two components to this diagram. Those being the dorsal and ventral roots. All right, so let's draw on the dorsal and ventral roots. So here is the dorsal root, which I'm drawing on at the moment. And here is the ventral root, which I'm drawing on right now. Now, as I hope you can recall, the dorsal root here is the structure which contains sensory information. And the ventral root here is the structure which contains motor axons going out to skeletal muscles. So let's draw those on. So if we consider the dorsal root, in comes a sensory axon. It has its cell body in the dorsal root ganglia, the swelling there along the dorsal root. And then it goes through the dorsal root to sign up, say, in the dorsal horn there. The ventral root has axons whose cell bodies lie within the ventral horn here and then they pass through the ventral root like this to go out to muscles. Now that we've drawn these two axons we can emphasize an important fact and, and in fact this is this is something which took scientists a very long time to establish definitively. The dorsal root is purely sensory. So if you have an injury to the dorsal root, you will get isolated sensory symptoms. The ventral root is purely motor. So if you affect the ventral root, say by an injury, then you will get purely motor symptoms. However, the spinal root, sorry, the spinal nerve formed by the coalescence of the dorsal and ventral roots is mixed. It is both sensory 
and motor. So if you damage a spinal nerve, you will experience both motor and sensory symptoms. Now, we've missed out, of course, one important, an important component in this system, and that's the autonomic component. And, and you'll recall that the autonomic components, um, their cell bodies are found in this part, frequently called the lateral horn. Um, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems give different names to this, but essentially it is the lateral horn in both cases, whether it's in the thoracic cord or the sacral cord. And this cell body sends its axon down through the ventral root and into the spinal nerve, like this. Okay, so that's our autonomic component. So spinal nerves are not only sensory and motor, but they are also autonomic nerves. So let's just, for the sake of completeness, just put the colours around these. So autonomic we're using orange, motor we're using purple, and sensory we're using green. So now let's try to make the cranial nerves easier to understand by simply extending this principle of spinal nerves rostrally. And, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the same colour scheme we've been using already um, to draw on our longitudinal view the dorsal horn, the ventral horn and the lateral horn. So in purple, let's draw on the ventral horn on our longitudinal view. So see the ventral horn of the spinal cord just visualised longitudinally throughout the whole cord. Okay, So we're thinking of it as a column of grey matter extending through the cord. In orange, we're going to add our lateral horn. And as you should be aware, the lateral horn does not extend throughout the full length of the cord. The lateral horn is just found in the thoracic, upper lumbar and sacral regions. It's not found in the um, lower lumbar regions. But for the sake of simplicity, we've shown it as a continuous column. And then the dorsal horn, we're going to draw in green. Right, so you'll notice that I've maintained their relationships with one another so the ventral horn sitting most closely to the front the dorsal horn sitting at the back and the lateral horn halfway in between now the next thing you've got to imagine is that these three columns of grey matter are extending up into the brain stem and they're getting jumbled up a little bit, but still the basic idea that there is a sensory dorsal horn, a motor ventral horn, and an auto autonomic lateral horn continues up into the brainstem. And those three functions continue to be represented just like in the spinal cord. So we can represent this as these interrupted lines. So we maintain the same colours, but we add these interrupted lines to show that the grey matter structures found in the spinal cord simply extend up into the brainstem. And this is a tremendously powerful concept because it helps us to understand the fact that the cranial nerves which emerge from the brainstem have very close affinities with the spinal nerves. So let's draw on the crani some cranial nerves emerging from the brainstem. Okay. And what I'm saying is, is that the axons found within those cranial nerves emerging from the brainstem have got just the same origins or destinations as those axons which were destined for the spinal cord. So...
Just think of what's going on here. Something very similar is taking place in the brainstem itself. So, to illustrate this, let's take the example of the trigeminal nerve, which you're going to learn a lot more about. Um, but I'm just going to draw, here's just one half of the pons, which is where the trigeminal nerve emerges from. Now, as you'll discover, the trigeminal nerve has actually got two uh, components to it. It's got quite a large sensory component and a much smaller motor component. So to recap, this is the pons of the brainstem. We're thinking about the trigeminal nerve. This is the large sensory component. This is the smaller motor component. Now, can you see a similarity here to the spinal nerves? Can you appreciate that the pons in this instance can be thought of as equivalent to the spinal cord? The large sensory component can be thought of as equivalent to the dorsal root. And the smaller motor component can be thought of as equivalent to the ventral root. And we can even take this further. Within the pons there are two areas of grey matter relevant to the trigeminal nerve. One is known as the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve and one is known as the sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Now the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve so here's the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve let's just um, label that with a, an M and the sensory nucleus with an S. The motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve is directly equivalent to the ventral horn of the spinal cord. The sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve is directly equivalent to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. All right? By virtue of the fact that we can imagine the grey matter in the cord extending rostrally but splitting up into these def different discrete nuclei. So we can go so far as to draw on the cell body of a motor neuron in the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve and show its axon going out through the small motor component off to the muscles of mastication. And we can show a sensory neuron sending its axon into the sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. So I think that this is a really important basic concept. This understanding that the cranial nerves are simply very sophisticated, specialised spinal nerves. And, and, and the trigeminal nerve is, is, is another nice example, which, and it illustrates something additional. If you look at the size of the dorsal root and the size of the ventral root in the spinal cord, you see that they're pretty similar diameters. However, if you look at the pons, and if you consider the trigeminal nerve example that we gave, the sensory root here is much, much bigger than the motor root. And in some cranial nerves, we see that this has been taken to an extreme. So, for example, if we think about the optic nerve, the optic nerve has a purely sensory function and has no motor functions at all. Okay? Conversely, if we consider the hypoglossal nerve, which supplies the tongue, the hypoglossal nerve has a large motor root and no sensory root whatsoever. 
So when I say that the cranial nerves are super specialised, what I mean is that they're able to achieve this by having different relative sizes to their sensory and motor components. And it's a useful exercise to think in this way and go through the full list of cranial nerves to try to consider that. Of course, um, we haven't included um, our autonomic component in this, uh, but it could easily be added. Um, one thing to note is that the autonomics frequently run through the sensory route of the cranial nerves, which is different to in the spinal cord. A second thing that you need to be aware of um, is that, strictly speaking, the first and the second cranial nerves, the olfactory and the optic nerves, are, are not true cranial nerves uh, in the sense that they emerge from the brainstem and have similarities to the spinal nerves. Strictly speaking, the olfactory and the optic nerves are extensions of the brain itself, direct extensions of the brain, meaning that they have slightly different properties and also meaning that some of these rules that we've discussed can't necessarily be directly applied to them. So I hope that this was a clear introduction to some of the really core fundamental principles of cranial nerves.